All right, uh, let's get started into our, wait for it, last lecture of the semester. Now, now what that means, now what, I, I, it's almost like you're happy this is over, and I don't know how I'm supposed to take that. Oh, <laughs> nice, nice try. <laughs> Okay, all right, all right, everybody settle down, settle down. Okay, let, let's get through some housekeeping, okay? Everybody settle down, pay attention. All right, so today uh, we've got our last lecture topic, which, uh, which is looking at asphalt concrete. I'm not going to get super deep into uh, asphalt design methods, um, but what I am going to do is uh, go through uh, some, some fundamental calculations associated with asphalt design, because regardless, there, there's really three different uh, methods uh, that are used for asphalt pavement design and um, regardless of which method that you use there are some fundamental uh, void analysis uh, uh, calculations that you need to be able to do so I'm actually going to focus a little bit on that they're not hard but um, a lot of times I think you'll find with these uh, design methodologies that once you understand those that actually going through the asphalt design is pretty straightforward but when you see like a, 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 a VMA or a VFA, what is this? So that's sort of what I'm going to try and uh, cover today. Now we're going to have an exam three review, but I want I just so you're aware, the lecture today is going to be probably somewhat short. It's not going to go all the way to 2 o'clock. So we're just going to start the exam review literally right as we, um, uh, right as we finish lecture. We'll get into that and then uh, go from there. Now let's talk about assignments. So um, you all have a homework assignment due today uh, on uh, homework six on steel and aluminum. I sent you all an email that said if you all want, I'll give you all some time because there's some printouts and whatnot. So if you want to turn that in by five o'clock today, that's completely fine. Just leave it on the cart outside my office. If uh, you've got it ready now, just go ahead and turn it in now. I'll go ahead and take them. Um, let's talk about next week. So next week, class is canceled for both Tuesday and Thursday because we're pretty much done. There's, uh, there's one topic that we really didn't talk about, and that's composite materials. But even if we were to talk about composite materials, we'd only be giving it a 30,000 foot view. Okay, I was about to say, is that Java again? No, this is Adobe. Um, just close that. Um, we'd only be giving composite materials a 30,000 foot overview anyway, so I've just decided to go ahead and and skip that. Plus, there's plenty of material on the exam with steel, aluminum, wood, and asphalt. So there's plenty of material for the exam. Now let's talk about homework assignments. I would give you as much time as possible on the homeworks as well, but um, you know, I, I can't really do too much. I'm not here next week. So what I'm going to do is this. Homework 7, your timber and asphalt assignment. I'm going to have that due at 2 o'clock, okay, on the cart outside my office. At 2 o'clock, I'm going to have a faculty member come and collect that for me, and at 2 o'clock, the solution's going to turn on, okay? But if I don't have it, or if whoever I get to grab it for me, if they don't have it by 2 o'clock, I can't accept anything late because you'll literally have the solution, okay? Sound good? All right, now let's talk about uh, the final, okay? So the first off, the final homework assignment is also due at 2 p.m., and it's due on Blackboard. So let me explain how that works. Um, the other day, I created uh, groups on Blackboard for all the six lab groups. So you should log on and you should be uh, assigned according to your lab group, okay? Now, everybody on, uh, on Blackboard has access to the, the final homework assignment, okay? So let's say you're in lab group one. Group one, raise your hand. Okay, so everybody in lab group one has the authority to submit lab group number one's lab report, okay? So any one of you all can submit it. And I've also turned it on to unlimited attempts. I'm just going to grade the last submission. So you can submit to your heart's content between now and next Thursday at 2 o'clock. Okay? The only thing I would suggest is get, uh, I've got two things. One, just figure out who in your group is actually going to be the person to submit. Uh, that's probably kind of important. You don't want to get to 2 o'clock go, I thought you were turning it in. I thought you were. Who's on first? You know? Um, so, <laughs> nice. So, <laughs> so just, just first thing, make sure that you know who is actually the person who's going to submit. Uh, and two, make sure that when you submit your lab report, submit it as one comprehensive PDF. Don't submit 
37 files that I have to sort of piece together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, just give, make it easy for me. Give me one file that, uh, that I can print off and grade. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, you know, I honestly really don't care as long as it's one document. So if you want to leave it in Word doc format, that's fine, as long as it is a single file. Any questions? Now, if you got exam questions, we're going to have an exam review here in a little bit. One other thing, okay, course evals. So I checked this right before class, and I had I had 15 out of 32 students who have completed it, but I only have 12 students who have uploaded it. Now, a few of you have sent me emails with the course eval, and that's great, but I promise you I will lose it, okay? I'm using, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm being honest with you, I am using course eval to keep track of who submitted it. And if you submit me an email, I, I, I just don't want to lose it, okay? So please just upload that image to Course Eval, and again, free homework points. Uh, especially for the three of you that have done it and didn't upload, okay? Yes, uh, like, like a grade. So like you, would, like you would submit any homework assignment online, because I, I promise you I will lose it. Uh, and I, I don't want to see you get cheated out of homework points because, because I lost it. So. Sound good? One other thing I'm probably going to do at the end of lecture, uh, I don't know how I'm going to, uh, we'll, we'll sort of figure it out, but uh, you all have been in engineering enough to know that we usually do these sort of course, course learning outcome surveys at the end of the semester. I usually do them during the final, the, during the final exam, but I'm not going to be here, and this is our last lecture, so I'll probably do this today. I'll just pass this around let you all do this, and I'll elect somebody to collect them for me, if that's okay. So we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. Let's talk about asphalt concrete, if there are no other, no other questions. Okay, so first off, if you ever hear somebody use the term asphalt concrete or hot mixed asphalt or something like that, it's the same thing, okay? Now, like I said, um, I am not um, going to go through, you know, uh, in detail a hot mixed asphalt pavement uh, designs because I mean, we don't have time to, to go through that in significant detail anyways. I mean, like I said, pavement design and flexible pavement design, these are just classes in and of themselves. I mean, concrete design, was, was, the actual concrete mix design was complicated enough. That took, if you think about it, that actually took a really long time to fully understand because we had to have, you know, a whole massive set of lectures on just aggregates, on just specific gravities and moisture contents, all that, before we could even understand uh, properties of cement to even be able to discuss concrete mix design. That was half the semester. I'm telling you, pavement design is just as intricate. There's just there's uh, many more uh, uh, design methodologies. There's um, there's there's uh, a whole host of different properties that you need to understand. So I'm not going to um, uh, I'm not going to go through those methods in detail. What I am going to do is cover them in a general uh, 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 overarching perspective, and I'm also going to uh, go through some of the void analysis calculations that you would need to do for each method. They're not hard, but I do want to uh, make sure that you all kind of understand this. It's very possible also that on something like, oh, I don't know, an FE exam, they might ask you for a VFA calculation, and what the heck is a VFA calculation? Now you'll know after today. So um, regardless of what application uh, that you are, um, you know, that, that or, or what design methodology you're using, there are some general objectives you're trying to meet. Uh, number one, you want to try and design an asphalt pavement that's stable, uh, that's going to uh, sufficiently resist permanent deformation uh, under repeated loadings. Speaking of repeated loading, one big thing that you have to assess uh, pavement design uh, 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 applications for is the concept of fatigue. Have I discussed fatigue with you all before? The idea that under repeated loadings uh, an element is weaker than if it's just statically loaded to failure. Well, pavements, that's definitely the case because you've got cars going over pavements uh, all day long. Uh, making sure that uh, pavement applications can resist uh, thermal cracking appropriately and uh, resist hardening or aging uh, and whatnot during the application process, uh, and et cetera. Um, <coughs> now, when you're designing uh, and, and, and asphalt concrete. So when I say asphalt concrete, what I mean is the asphalt binder mixed with the aggregate. That's essentially what we're talking about, okay? 
when you're uh, performing an asphalt concrete mix design, what you're trying to determine is how much binder needs to go into the aggregate to make asphalt. That, that's, that's basically what you're trying to determine. Now typically, uh, you're, you're putting somewhere between 4% and 7% asphalt binder uh, in a mix to, uh, to design an asphalt concrete by, by weight. Okay, so if you have 100 pounds of aggregate, it's somewhere between 4 and 7 pounds uh, of asphalt. Now, it can get a little touchy, and, and you got to be real careful with, with getting those, those values uh, exactly right. I mean, if you're doing laboratory uh, assessments of, of asphalt samples, I mean, you got to get those, those weights down like super exact. And, and you're talking about this really hot asphalt liquid that you're trying to measure out to like the tenth of a gram can get a little touchy, okay? So you got to be real careful about that. But, but the thing is, um, asphalt can, can get a little touchy for a number of reasons. If you put too little asphalt binder in a, uh, uh, in a given uh, uh, asphalt concrete mix, then what happens is not all of the aggregate uh, is coated, okay? So that's going to create a mix that's less stable and less durable. But if you put too much binder in a mix, you get a, an asphalt concrete that's a little slippery, okay? So it's too much lubrication, and so it's not as stable as well. So there's a, a nice little sweet spot uh, that you've got to uh, that you've got to achieve, and typically it's somewhere between uh, four and seven uh, seven percent. Um, one thing I do want you to uh, be aware of the the three methods of uh, asphalt concrete mix design. Um, if there's any one thing I want you to be able to uh, uh, know about asphalt concrete design, it would be what are the three common methods. And the three most common methods of asphalt concrete mix design are the Marshall method, uh, the Havim method, and SuperPave. Now, the, the, the t first two, they are very empirical. They're using, you know, curve fit data to come up with a simplified, uh, easy to use approach. It's very common uh, that students, uh, you know, when you, when you take a, uh, a pavement design class, this, these are very commonly mentioned. Let me ask you this, uh, for those of you that have had transportation, were these mentioned in that course? Super paved was mentioned? Okay, all right, all right. So I, I wanted to make sure that, you, you, uh, that there was some carryover, that you at least seen some of this stuff before. Most DOHs are using super paved, but it, it's, it's a lot more rigorous. There's a lot more calculations that are involved with it. It's performance based. Um, it's based on uh, a, 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 you know, locally available, you know, you know, local test data and et cetera. Um, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a little uh, intricate, which is why, I mean, there's no way I'm, I'm going to expect you all to be experts at, at SuperPave uh, when you get out of here. That, that's not really the point of this class. I just want you to understand uh, some of the materials related aspects. Um, a little bit about SuperPave, um, it's, it's kind of an acronym, it stands for Superior Performing Asphalt Pavement, so that's where the SuperPave comes from. Um, Typically, your volumetric design process, and, and volumetric design should be somewhat familiar because we did volumetric design when we were proportioning concrete mixes. Well, proportioning uh, asphalt concrete mixes uh, using SuperPave uh, is kind of uh, similar. Um, you, you know, you're, you're selecting your aggregate, uh, selecting your binder, determining the, the design aggregate structure, the binder structure, and then evaluating its susceptibility to moisture. Now, when, I, when I'm talking about, you know, first off, when I'm saying things like aggregate structure uh, and what have you uh, and, and determining the actual type of aggregate that we use, we're referring back to a lot of stuff that we mentioned um, earlier in the semester, you know, things like uh, a aggregate gradation, aggregate uh, angularity, you know, uh, it, it surface characteristics, There's all, all of those aspects are pretty critical in the, um, uh, in the appropriate design uh, using SuperPave. Um, like I said, I'm not uh, expecting you to um, be experts at it. If you are interested in SuperPave, I have a link here to a really nice uh, uh, example. It's pretty long, but it's pretty uh, 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 straightforward. The only things that might be a little iffy are some of the void calculations, which is what we're going to talk about uh, today. Now, <coughs> Marshall Method and Havim Method are empirical approaches basically using a lot of curve fit data to sort of uh, compute a best fit um, uh, uh, asphalt content. Typically, you know, you can see here for a given uh, example set of calculations, based on uh, void analyses, you know, for instance, we have a range here somewhere between 4 and 5 percent of the amount of asphalt you would, uh, you would in, uh, install in that given mix. So, you know, a lot like what we did with blending, just take the middle and, and just uh, go with it. 
you're basically, <coughs> um, once you evaluate uh, your aggregate and your binder, uh, det again, determining angularity, surface characteristics, things like that, you perform a void analysis. We're going to talk about that here in a second. And then based on those values, curve fit, bam, there's your, uh, there's your answer. So it's very empirical, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and pretty simplified. Um, I mentioned the Haveen method just so you're aware of different, um, uh, uh, different pavement methodologies. It was named after the person who developed it back in the uh, 40s. Now, um, we don't really use this around here because the Haveen method is primarily used uh, for uh, applications in the western uh, United States. Um, and it, again, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, how shall I put this? A lot of the goals of uh, not just asphalt concretes, but concretes in general, is to try and utilize locally available aggregates to their most optimum uh, uh, performance. So <laughs> what you're trying to do in, in the Haveen method is you're trying to assure maximum stability and durability of your, uh, of your given application. So your optimum asphalt content is really a function of a lot of the characteristics associated with your aggregate the surface texture, the porosity, the surface area, uh, et cetera. So again, it's, it's another very empirical approach based on the uh, uh, stability and durability of your locally available aggregates. It's pretty curve fit. Bam, there's your, uh, there's your asphalt. Again, though, regardless of what method that you use, this all goes back to actually um, doing some fundamental density and void analysis calculations uh, that we're going to go through now. So the idea behind this is trying to determine the percent of voids in a given asphalt mixture. So it's going to involve things like uh, the, the computation of specific gravity, the computation of weights uh, and volumes, uh, et cetera. Now, we tend to use volumetric approaches because I mean, I, you know, we're, we're obviously trying to uh, uh, determine an, an amount of volume for a, for a given application. But as you all are aware, I mean, volumes are kind of difficult to determine. Um, you know, if I have, you know, let's take, let's go back to aggregate discussion. If I have a sample of aggregate, I can very, very easily determine the weight of that aggregate. I just put it on a scale. But it's kind of tough to determine the volume of that aggregate because there, there's these things called voids in the aggregate, right? And we, we, we found some ways of getting around that. For instance, you know, we'll use something like submerged weight or use saturated weights to sort of, uh, come up with a um, uh, sort of a uniform way of characterizing uh, aggregates, but volumes tend to be a little uh, tend to be a little trickier to measure. So what we'll ultimately do is use weights and then convert using specific gravities. So that, that's uh, essentially the uh, the general uh, gist of what we're doing. Now, when I say uh, avoids analysis, what I mean is this. Okay. Now I have here on the right uh, what's called a, a phase diagram. Okay. Now, this is, um, this is probably not that familiar now. I'm curious, how many of you have already taken soils? Okay. If you've already taken soils, that really should be familiar, right? It looks very similar to an air, water, and solid uh, diagram that you use to characterize uh, a soil sample. For those of you who are about to take it, you should see that sometime next semester. Um, now, <coughs> now um, so, so what we're trying to do is characterize in a, in a soil, or in, I, have, I keep saying soil phase diagram because it's such a common uh, analysis in, in soils, but what we're trying to assess in this phase diagram is to try and completely define the constitutive uh, uh, components of a given asphalt mix. So looking at uh, a given uh, asphalt mix, basically what we have is, well, first off, we've got the aggregate, right? So whatever, you know, the coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, what have you that goes into the mix. We have the asphalt binder itself, recognizing that some of that asphalt binder is actually going to be absorbed into the voids of the aggregate. But then there's also air. I mean, there's always some amount of air present uh, in an asphalt. Now, if we were talking about soil, we would have air, we would have our solids, and then there's a third component that goes into soil, and that is water. There's some amount of water in soil. Okay? <clears throat> now, for each of those components, we have a, a weight that we can compute and a volume that we can compute. And when you get into soils, there's all sorts of different comparisons that you can make with uh, uh, porosity and percent voids and et cetera, et cetera. And all those uh, different properties are used 
for various uh, computations associated with geotechnical engineering. This is not geotechnical engineering, so I'm not going to even pretend to get into that. I'm just going to get into uh, to what's important uh, associated with asphalt. And essentially, regardless of what, um, uh, regardless of what uh, uh, methodology that you are using to compute uh, or, or to design an asphalt concrete, there are there are three very important very important void measurements uh, that are used. So the first one is VTM. VTM stands for the percent of voids in the total mix. So how many voids are totally uh, are in the total mix uh, of your asphalt? And so theoretically, the way that you would compute that is you take the volume of your voids and divide it by V sub M, the total volume of your mixtures. That's what V sub M is. By the way, notice uh, on your uh, phase diagram, for each component, like aggregate, we have a V sub S, weight of the solids or weight of the aggregate, and V sub S, the volume of the solids. Why don't we have anything up here? What's that? There's, it's air. What is the weight of air? It's zero. It doesn't have any weight. Okay. So, so just see or where anytime you see a, a soil phase diagram, like what's W sub A? It, it's zero. There is no weight of air. All right. <coughs> so we have VTM, the percent of voids in the total mix. We have VMA, the amount of voids that are actually in the mineral aggregate, and then VFA, the uh, percent of voids of those voids that are filled uh, with asphalt. So basically, what we're doing is we're taking uh, th these are basically just various comparisons of the volume of voids, the volume of solids, the volume of the total mixture, and the volume of the, uh, the actual asphalt binder. Now, like I said, um, volumes are a little tough to measure. But if we can characterize um, specific gravities, which is a, you know, a very uh, common application in, um, in lab tests, I mean, we've been, we did that for aggregates all through the earlier part of the semester. Well, if you've got a specific gravity and a weight, you can back calculate a, a volume. Now, there's a couple specific gravities that we're going to use that uh, you, you haven't seen yet. So I want to uh, uh, define these for you. So first off, uh, GMM. Okay? GMM stands for the theoretical maximum specific gravity of the asphalt concrete. And let me explain what that means. So, so first off, if you ever hear, if you're ever talking about asphalt, and you ever hear the term rice gravity, that we're, we're talking about the same thing. That stands for a guy named Jim Rice from the Asphalt Institute who developed uh, the test in order to measure this. And the idea is this is essentially the theoretically the maximum possible specific gravity that you could get out of an, an asphalt concrete. So, so think about this mathematically. Um, in order to get the maximum, the theoretically the maximum possible specific gravity, how many voids would you have to have? Zero, right? So how do you actually determine this? It's you vacuum it. You actually are vacuuming out that air. You're essentially submerging a, a loose mix and vacuuming out all the air and then measuring your weights uh, accordingly. So GMM uh, is a theoretical maximum specific gravity. We can compute it also using uh, laboratory measurement data as well. We're going to go through an example of that later. Okay. <coughs> There's GSE. GSE is the effective specific gravity of the aggregate. But the difference is, is that's if it's been coated with asphalt. So it's going to be a little different than uh, just the bulk specific gravity. Now G sub B, that's the specific gravity of the actual asphalt binder. And, and that's a lookup. That just comes straight from the, uh, the manufacturer. Asphalt tends to have a specific gravity somewhere like 1.02, 1.04, 1.06. It's very, very close to the specific gravity uh, of water. Now, <coughs> just so you are aware, we can um, use that GMM value to compute what's the effect of specific gravity of the asphalt uh, when the binder's surrounding it. And, and, I, and I'm showing you this equation. Uh, we're not really going to directly use it too much, but I'm showing you this to sort of bring back something from way back when, um, when we talked about specific gravities. Remember, uh, if I have aggregate A and I have aggregate B and I mix them together, now I can compute the angularity or the percent passing the number four sieve or what have you with just a weighted average, you know, 20% of that plus 80% of this and bam. But specific gravity, that was the one that was a little weird. Remember you took the fractional values and then you took one over that to get the specific gravity of the blend? Remember, it's been a while, but we did that. Y'all remember that? 
Well, we're doing the same thing here. We're not really going to use this value, but I'll show you this just to go, oh, yeah, it's been a while since we've done that. Um, now, <coughs> if we're talking about weighted percentages, we really only have two percentages to consider. We have a percent of solids, or the aggregate, and the percent of binders. So whatever those percentages are, they have to add up to be 100%. Okay? Sound good? All right. Now, we end up, so like I said, we can compute these um, uh, volume of, uh, 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 you know, voids in the, the, the mineral aggregate, the volume of voids uh, that are filled with asphalt, et cetera. You know, technically they are defined using volumes, but because volumes are a little iffy uh, to compute, we can use specific gravities. Now, how do you get from here to here? Just a bunch of algebra. It's basically just taking substitutions, rearranging, plug and chug. So you're more than welcome to exercise that if you'd like, or just trust me. I mean, I, I mean, we could derive it if you want. We, I made it a point when we first started looking at specific gravities to derive why it was that fractional relationship. So I mean, we could do it if you want, but I, I really don't think it would be very necessary. Um, there are a couple specific gravity terms that weren't mentioned on previous slides. So for instance, bulk, specificity, uh, bulk specific gravity of the aggregate, now we have done that, uh, and bulk specific gravity of the mixture. We are going to compute that uh, here in a little bit. Um, everybody good with this so far? If, if some of these formulas are a little strange, don't worry, we're going to go through an example here very quickly. Sound good? Okay. So. I have uh, some data regarding uh, a specimen of hot mix asphalt, okay? So first off, I want to look at this table over here on the right, okay? This table over here on the right shows the amount of uh, aggregate and the amount of binder that went into the mixture. So I have about 1.76 pounds of aggregate 1, 2.43 pounds of aggregate 2, et cetera, et cetera, and about 0.22 pounds uh, of binder, okay? Now, I used these ingredients and mixed them together to develop uh, uh, an asphalt uh, lab specimen to do, do various testing on. Okay? Now, um, <coughs> if you add all these weights up, like somebody just add these values up, tell me what you get. It's like five something pounds. I think it's like 5.51. Okay, 5.51 pounds. So when it's all said and done, you add this up, you get about five and a half pounds. I drew from that mixture a sample, okay? So I drew from that mixture a, a sample and I compacted it. You typically compact uh, uh, asphalt specimens for, uh, for laboratory testing. And that specimen had a weight of two and a half pounds and then a volume of 30.5 cubic inches, okay? Now based on this aggregate data, and based on the sample that I drew, I want to do a voids analysis. I want to compute these appropriate specific gravities, and I want to compute uh, these uh, void ratios. So far, so good? Okay. If you're writing down this data, don't worry. I'm going to copy this table over onto my handy-dandy little notebook. Let me see if this works. Whoa, that was actually kind of cool. It just sort of like reformatted it for me. What's that? Can you all read that? Make that a little bigger? A little better? Is that better? Okay. So this is example 11, our last example of the semester. Okay. What's that? Well, actually, I'm going to get through this quickly. All right. So I have here my four aggregates and my binder that went into uh, this given sample. Okay. So there's a couple things that we need to uh, compute. Okay. The first thing that we need to compute is a bulk specific gravity. And this bulk specific gravity uh, is the bulk specific gravity of the aggregate. Okay.
and that's GSB. In other words, when you're designing an asphalt concrete, basically the only thing you want to know is how much asphalt needs to go into the mix. So I need to be able to treat these four aggregates as if they are one. Okay? Now, let me show you how I'm going to do this. So for now, I'm going to kind of ignore this, uh, uh, this binder. I'm going to kind of ignore that. So let, let's take a look at this. All right. So I've got aggregate one, aggregate two, aggregate three, aggregate four. Okay. Now bear with me. Some of this is going to get a little repetitive. Okay. Now my weight is 1.76, 2.43, 0 0.77, 0 0.33. Now sum these up and tell me what you get. Five point two nine. Do I have a second on that? All right. What? He's still at thirty seven. He said second, right? <laughs> Come on, man. It's our last day. <laughs> I was like totally confused. I had no idea what you were talking about. All right. Let me explain. All right. So we're going to try and treat this, these four aggregates. We're going to mix them together and sort of conceptualize and sort of ask ourselves, let's, let's treat these as if they are one unique mixture. Okay. So to start off, the, first, the next thing I'm going to compute is this. I'm going to calculate uh, percentages. Now, let me ask you this. There's a total of 5.29 pounds of aggregate in this mix. Now, aggregate number one is 1.76. On a percentage basis, how much of this, this you know, composite aggregate, how much of it is as, uh, aggregate number one? Now, say that again. 33.27. How'd you get that? There you go. So if you take 1.76 divided by 5.29 and then multiply it by 100, you get, and say that again, 33 point, like what, 27? Sound good? Do these for the rest of these. Tell me what you get. All right. Next one. 14.56. And the last one. What's another way of checking these numbers? What do they add up to be? It's the last day. Is that what it is? We're going to troll Dr. Mike on the last day. That would just ramp it up on the last day, right? The trolling gets asymptotic, right? All right, what do we got? For, did it come out to be 100? 100.01. Okay, so that's just rounding. All right, let's talk about asphalt. Okay, now the last thing I'm going to write are the specific gravity values. So 2.62, 2.51, 2.43, 2.43, 2.44, 2.45, 2.46, 2.48, 2.49, 2.50, 2.51, 2.52, 2.53, 2.54, 2.55, 2.56, 2.57, 2.58, 2.59, 2.60, 
over your G's. So like 100% divided by P1 over G1 plus P2 over G2. Y'all remember this? It's been a while, but, but uh, I know, know we've done it. So while we're at it, let's do this. I've got a P column and I've got a G column. Let's do P over G. So what's 33.27 uh, divided by 2.62? Twelve point seven zero. All right. What's that? It's almost PG thirteen. That's pretty good. All right. That's pretty good. So what do we get here? Eighteen point three zero. And somebody else. Somebody over here. Like, oh, we have to break out our calculator. That's a lot of work. Uh, get somebody, get somebody over here. Come on. Say it again. All right. Somebody else. There we go. Two point what? Two point five eight. All right. So there's. It's been seconded. Okay. Now somebody else. Somebody in the middle. Sum these up and tell me what you get. I have to get coordinated. Second on that? So therefore, the bulk specific gravity of the aggregate is just 100 divided by 39.47. And I'll go ahead and do that for you. It comes out to be about 2.534. I mean, does that value make sense? Look at the aggregates, 2.62, 2.51, 2.47, 2.42. There's got to be somewhere in there, you know. Does that make sense? Well, I'm just showing it so you all can follow the counts, yes. Yeah, we did, we did one, and then we used these as decimals, but it's been a while, and I think this is a little easier to follow, so... And plus, plus another thing, VFA formulas and, and VMA formulas and VTF formulas, when you look them up, they tend to have the hundreds in them. So I was like, let's just be consistent so we all know what we're going off of. But it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. I mean, if you're in Excel, I might ignore it and just use percentages. So, Are we, are we good? My goodness. Okay. Now. Now, the next thing that we're going to compute, and, and I apologize for this being repetitive, but the next thing that we're going to compute is the maximum theoretical specific gravity of the mixture. Or GMM. Okay. Now, what that means is, is we're determining the specific gravity of the mixture of aggregate and the binder, assuming zero voids. So all we use are the masses of the aggregates and the mass of the binder. So it's sort of like doing this all over again, but one more line. So. So, now, I'm going to just do this really quickly. So, aggregate 1, aggregate 2, aggregate 3, aggregate 4, I'm, I'm just sort of doing it for you, though. I would do it in Excel is what I would do. That would be the lazy way of doing it. Okay, 
So the weight in pounds. So basically I'm doing this entire thing again, but I'm throwing another uh, component into it. So 1.76, 2.43, 0.76, 0.43. And now we have the binder, which is 0 0.22. Now I believe you added that up and got that to be 5.51. So now my percentages are going to be a little different because I'm not comparing to 5.29, I'm comparing to 5.51. So my percentages, oh, it's not an RSP. So take each of these values and divide them by 5.51. And you get 31.94, 44 point 10, uh, 13.97, 5.99, I can do better than that, and then 3.99, and that should add up to give you 100. Mr. Filsinger says, 99.99. I'm, I'm kidding. I, I don't have children. <laughs> okay. Our specific gravities, 2.62, 2.51, 2.47, 2.42, 2 2 and 1.06. So now I can calculate P over G again, and I get 12.19, uh, 17.57, 5.66. Am I going too fast or do you all, you all follow along with what I'm doing? It's just the same thing over and over again. So 2.47, 3.77. So add this up, it should be 41.66. So the maximum theoretical specific gravity is 100 divided by 41.66. And if you do that math, it actually comes out to be just about uh, exactly about that. It, it's pretty close. It's pretty. <laughs> I haven't made the exam yet. And you got folks in here that are seniors that are like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> and, and just when they get the exam, they're going to be thinking, if Mr. Skaggs just hadn't said that. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Everybody good so far? Okay. All right. Uh, a couple more values, and I think you're going to find this is pretty simple. Okay. So the next value is this, okay? The next value that we have to compute is the bulk specific gravity of the mixture. And that is GMB, okay? Now, this one is actually uh, measured using the sample that was drawn off, okay? so. If you recall, that sample, um, let's see, that sample had a weight of 2.55 pounds, okay? And it had a volume of 30.5 cubic inches. So this is compacting that sample and, and measuring its volume, okay? Excuse me. So I could determine, how would I determine the bulk unit weight? How do you determine unit weight? Weight divided by volume, okay? So weight divided by volume will tell me the unit weight. If I want to determine the specific gravity, I take that unit weight and divide it by what? The unit weight of water. And what is the unit weight of water? Boy. You've been dealing with too much metric. 62.4 uh, what? Pounds per cubic Not cube, my bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pounds per cubic feet. We have a volume in cubic inches. So therefore, watch this, okay? This is what we're going to do. We're going to take GMB is going to be 
the weight divided by the volume times the unit weight of water, but there's going to be a unit conversion thrown in there. So we're going to have 2.55 pounds divided by, okay, so I'm going to have 62.4 pounds per cubic feet, and we're going to have 30.5 cubic inches, but we've got to have a, a unit conversion in there, something that will turn that cubic inches into cubic feet. It's like structural analysis came back. 17, we have, so we have one, oh, I can be better than that. So one cubic feet is equal to 1,728 cubic inches. My goodness, this pen's good. Ignoring that. And yeah, and, and <laughs> here's the thing. It's like I give you kudos for your bravery, but but look how many faculty we have left. What are you gonna do? Take off the one, the one that's left? <laughs> I mean, like you all were stuck with me for a while. Are you sure this is a good strategy? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> I love this job. What, what do you got? 2.32. I, I got, uh, yes, yeah, so I got 315. I'm just doing everything to three decimal places just because, just because. But, but is that about what y'all got? Okay, all right. <coughs> okay. There is only, now I'm actually going to ask you this, there is only one more value that we are actually going to need uh, for our void calculations, and that is the percent of solids in the mixture. In other words, the percent of aggregate. What is a very easy way to determine the percent of aggregate in the mixture? By weight, mind you. Haven't we already done that, though? Think about it. How much, I'm going to ask you a simple question. How much does the total mixture weigh? 5.51. How much does the total amount of aggregate weigh? 5.29. So just divide those two, and that will tell you the percent of um, solids in the mixture. So percent of solids. Or, or aggregate. So PS is just 5.29 divided by 5.51 and then times do, uh, by 100%. Uh, what do you get? So 96.01%. So, so what's our, so think about like this, what's our asphalt content? So pretty much like 4%, pretty close. So it's right around where it would be, okay? So now we can go ahead and start computing our, our void ratios. So the voids in the total mixture is just 100 times 1 minus... So you're basically taking specific gravities, so the bulk specific gravity of the mixture, but then the maximum theoretical specific gravity. So it's sort of like this is what you're actually getting, and this is what you would get with zero voids. So by, by taking the difference, you're determining well, how many total voids uh, are in the mixture. So that's 100 times 1 minus 2.315 divided by 2.400. That's another reason why I like three decimal places, so you know where the values are coming from, you know, so you can just easily see it. So what do you get? 3.5. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep that one simple. We'll say 3.54%. I got a second on that? All right. 
The next one is the voids in the mineral aggregate. And notice for that, we're using our bulk specific gravity, our bulk specific gravity of the aggregate, and then the percent of aggregate that's in the mixture. So this is really just looking at the voids in the aggregate. So 100 minus 2.315 times 96.01 over 2 point, and this one was 534. What do you get? I could divide the whole thing by 100 and just use ones. Well, it's 96% or 0.96. I'm using the hundreds because typically when you look up these formulas, the hundreds are already incorporated. So, Yeah, because this is 100, the one on the left. If it was 1, then it would just be 0.96. 2.315. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Okay, so this is the total, um, okay, so this is the total voids in the mixture when it's done. So, so think what you're comparing. You're comparing the bulk specific gravity of just an in-place sample against the maximum theoretical specific gravity where there are no voids at all, okay? Now this is the percent of voids in the mineral portion of the aggregate. So you're seeing you're using bulk specific gravity, bulk specific, uh, bulk specific gravity of the aggregate. Blech the percent of solids in the mixture, okay? Then what we're going to do is we're going to say of the voids that are present in the mixture, the last thing we're going to determine is of those voids, how much of those voids are filled with aggregate? You see what I mean? Uh, or with asphalt, sorry, with asphalt. Does that make sense? So, so the idea is of 12.29%. So, so think about it like this of 12.29% voids in the mineral aggregate, okay, when it was all said and done, there's 3.54% uh, voids left. So about 75% of those voids are filled with, with asphalt, you see what I mean? It's about, you know, so this is 12 and this is 3, so 9, 9 over 12 is like 75%, something like that. So let's, let's compute that. The voids the percent of the, of the voids that are in this aggregate, how much of them are filled with asphalt? And that is, we just take 100, and all we're doing is we're taking the difference of VMA, the Video Music Awards, no, I'm just kidding, um, and VTM divided by VMA. So this is 100. What are we getting here? I said 70, I guess 75, but it's going to be something. Two zero, do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. So of the void, so in this mixture of the voids that are present, 71% of those voids are filled with asphalt. Okay. So those three measures are essentially really key void ratios that you would use in either Marshall or SuperPEG or, or what have you. I just wanted you to understand those computations. Everything else is, I mean, it's not hard. It's just having all your data and going through the, through the steps. Any questions? Any questions? All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop this recording and in about 10 seconds start another recording on the exam review. So let, let, let's do that.